Okay, so we have a problem. Because my name is Simon Miller and I'm an absolute moron. Because if you have been watching Ups and Downs recently, you know we have been doing dress ups and downs. Now there's two more costumes that we are going to get through. But maybe, just maybe, somebody left them in their car. And maybe, just maybe, that car isn't accessible at the moment because it's being fixed. I mean, I'm sure you can work out what's happened here. So what we're going to do is this instead. We are going to spin it. It's going to go round and round for absolutely no reason. And it's going to end on a question mark or something like that. And I'm just going to go into my props and see what I have. That's right. <laughs> this is what I found. And I shall dump myself. Wrestling fan, you see at most events. That's mostly because of the belt. Don't forget, if you do bring a championship to a wrestling show, somebody is allowed to roll you up and beat you for it. Let's up those doubts. AEW nonsense started dynamite this week, and as you can tell, I like nonsense. But it was the Gun Club teaming with Swerve and Our Glory in order to take on FTR and the World Tag Team Champions, the Acclaimed. I mean, this had everything too, because not only did we continue to go wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland aren't going on very well, but we were also able to tell the story that FTR are flying here, there, and everywhere, defending all of their championships. And <laughs> when Max Caster did his rap, he was taking shots at Tom Brady. Billy Daddy Ass Gun also just ran in from nowhere and started beating up Strickland because of course he had broken his hand and I suppose you would do that in a wrestling environment. And when we finally got into the match itself, do you know what Austin Gunn decided to do? Just get thrown around the place and look like a goober. That dude totally gets it, so does Colton. We then sped things up when Swerve and Cash got in there and Keith Lee and Max Caster had a little bit of a look-see. And then before long, all the good guys had taken out the bad guys and they were in the corners doing the 10 punches. What is old is new again. Given this did leave a slight gap in proceedings, it's when FTR and the Acclaim did some scissoring, because of course you would do that in the middle of a fight. But I think what had happened here is that everybody had forgotten about W. Morrissey. Or at least I had. I think he was on the outside the whole time. And as soon as he saw these shenanigans smash, he started beating everybody up. When he booted Dax Harwood into the Phantom Zone and he got beaten up for a while before he made the hot tag to Anthony Bowens. And once again, just go and listen to the fans here. As they've been saying for a while now, everybody loves the acclaim. He also hit a variation of the famous onto Colton. I was like, <laughs> imagine he won with that move. And the gun club didn't appreciate that at all because then they hit a version of FTR's big ring. And I was like, man, everything is going out of control here, Toto. We need to get back to Kansas. And it was also around about this time when Keith Lee was in the middle going, oh, I don't know who I want to be friends with. So I tell you this, he is definitely going to turn heel. He still powerbombed the acclaimed into each other, which is always a ridiculous spot as Swerve took everybody out with a dive. And then, yes, eventually the guns were doing road dog type like jabs. And I tell you this, that was not a coincidence. I mean, just go and read the internet. Dax must have felt the same because he locked in the sharpshooter, which essentially opened the door for the acclaimed. They hit all their big moves, including the mic drop. FTR then hit their version of the big rig, which nobody kicks out of. One, two, three. I thought this was terrific fun, and it ties into the pay-per-view. Because we will do FTR versus the guns. We already know we're getting Swerve and our glory versus the acclaimed. All of this was absolutely fun. Get it up. And then we got this video promo for MJF. <laughs> you got to go and watch it. Now, there was nothing here that was going to make you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe he said that. But he just got into what wrestling is during this thing and said he's not just a wrestler, he's the wrestler. Much like Bruno Sammartino was the wrestler or The Rock or Stone Cold Steve Austin or John Cena. He was putting himself on the biggest pedestal and while he still thinks John Moxley is a pile of trash... He does respect him. Now, I don't know whether he's going heel, and I don't know whether he is going to stay face, but if it is the latter, I tell you, he's got the character down. And once again, he started talking about William Regal. Now, given that John Moxley also talks about Regal later on, I swear, I'm making the prediction now. I think the full gear is going to end up with Maxwell Jacob Freeman as the champ. And who's going to be next to him? That's right, it's going to be William. Either way, though, Friedman has absolutely come of age right now. And just find five minutes in your day to go and watch this. And it will definitely get you pumped for that pay-per-view. I mean, this is top-tier work. Up. We also teased more to do with this, because we also had a similar thing with Stokely Hathaway, who was talking about MGF in a video promo. And also said that he was dick-riding John Moxley without a license. 
there is no going back now. He also talked about their past together, so it's all there now. The chess pieces are on the board. We just have to decide where to move them. The firm was having a good evening too, because next up it was Ethan Page taking on Eddie Kingston in the first round of the World Title Eliminator Tournament. Flub me sideways, Ethan Page won. All of my dreams came true during this as well, because in the opening of this thing, Tony Schiavone just blurted out on commentary, oh yeah, by the way, in 2023, AEW is coming to the United Kingdom. And given that's where I'm based, well, I got very excited. They said the place where I live. I'm also going to shoot my shot because life is all about shooting your shot. So if AEW are coming here next year, somehow I am going to try and be involved. Now, this is a long shot and it's very much me trying to manifest things into existence. But look, life is all about taking chances. So giddy up, let's go. Maybe I'll even turn up like this. Of course, I was doubly happy as well because as already mentioned, Paige did win. Although this was tinged with sadness because I kind of watched the whole thing going, well, I do want Ethan Page to be victorious, but also I'd like Eddie Kingston to be victorious. So it's trying, like trying to choose between your children. I mean, it's not, but I like to increase the stakes. Really though, it should have been Page's moment because we're still waiting for his push in AEW and now is the time. And fair play to Excalibur who talked about the past between these guys and how they fought in this indie and they fought in that indie and they fought all across America. So they absolutely have history and it's probably gonna tie into this match. They kept going to the outside because they did want to fight and at one point Page got cut off in midair with an insiguri, but he had a plan for that when he was in the corner. Eddie ran at him and he just hit him with a power slam um, pretty good. Eventually Paige was ready to give him the ego's edge, but Eddie Kingston was able to turn that into the stretch plum. And of course, this is when Stokely Hathaway, who was at ringside, just started jumping around the place. He completely distracted the referee who didn't see Ethan Page tap out. Ortiz was done with this and so he chased Stokely away, but you could just see what was going to happen here. Although Eddie Kingston and Ethan Page went to the top rope and they started to fight. And when they were there, they got themselves into position and Ethan hit the ego's edge. An avalanche ego's edge. It looked like it killed Eddie Kingston, which kind of worked because he got pinned for the one, two, three. So there were certainly shenanigans here, but Paige still looked like a badass. And I tell you this, if you would like me to pick someone who should win this whole thing, I am going with Ethan Page. It's getting an up, but also bring it down. <laughs> Distraction counter. You definitely put one extra on the board. Renee Paquette was then backstage with Jose the assistant, Roosh and the Dark Order. And once again, Jose and Roosh were trying to butter up Ted. Not literally, I don't think they want to eat him. But because they believe Rush is going to become the next world champion, they said, hey, Ten, we like you, so you can have the first shot. But when it comes to you, Evil Uno, or you, Alex Reynolds, or you, John Silver, you are never going to get an opportunity. So this was a lot like when you get an Xbox and your little brother walks in and you go, ha, ha, not in a million years. This led to a big brawl, but the major takeaway is that we continue to tease something between Rush and Ten. I have no idea what it could be, apart from the fact that if they do get together, we can call them Rushton. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And then we got a TNT title match. I mean, that absolutely came from nowhere. For you see, Ari Davari was in the ring with his butler and was all like, look, if I do get a TNT title shot right now, I will be a very happy man. So Wardlow walked out and went, all right. He kicked the absolute crap out of him, hit him with the Powerbomb Symphony, and pinned him in around about two minutes. All of this was setting up for an angle though, and man, I was so happy. Because when we were done, Ward, he got on the microphone and was like, look, powerhouse Will Hobbs, you get out here right now, which he did. And of course, Samoa Joe had accompanied Wardlow to the ring. And because once again, Wardlow had kind of barged past Joe and said on the microphone, I am going to win every championship there is. Samoa was like, well, I'm done with this. You keep mugging me off and nobody mugs off Samoa Joe. So he crept up behind Wardlow and he choked him out. Now this wasn't some kind of cahoots thing either because then he walked past Hobbs and said, listen, pal, I'll take you out too. And don't I just have egg on my face? Because a few weeks ago, I was like, well, I want to see Samoa Joe versus Wardlow. And all I had to do was be patient. This also probably means at full gear, we're going to get Hobbs versus Joe versus Wardlow, which may be the biggest man, men, big men, slapping meat wrestling match in existence. And oh my gosh, I'm so damn excited. All of this was wunderbar. Get it up. We then got to confirm that it will be Nyla Rose versus Jade Cargill for the TBS Championship at Full Gear. And somehow I would still find a way to keep this on Nyla Rose, even though she's definitely going to lose. But I've liked this storyline. It's been very funny. And then nice things happened. 
I like nice. For we were having a face-off in the ring between Soraya and Britt Baker when Soraya said into a microphone, listen, Britt, it's unfortunate news for you because I am cleared to wrestle once again. Ooh, de lally. Now, there's always going to be some fear here in the same way there is with Brian Danielson or Edge or Christian or pick whoever the hell you want. But just go and watch this and look at Soraya's face and listen to the damn emotion in her voice. She sounds like the happiest and most fortunate person on the planet. So you can't hold her back. We just have to cross everything that she's going to be okay. Baker still was able to fire back here and kind of got the crowd on her side because she was all like, yeah, what an absolute bunch of BS because you are just another star coming from that other company and trying to ride AEW's coattail. Don't have a go at me just because you couldn't make it there. Believe you me, you're not going to make it here either. We had all this in the bag though because Soraya was all like, well, I've been in this business my entire life. You ain't nothing but a three-year rookie who got handpicked by Tony Khan. I've done this and I've done that and I've been here and I've been everywhere. Honestly, she spoke with so much passion. It was like, yeah, yeah, she absolutely has. So they are going to fight at full gear. And what an absolute wild ride this has been. Because if Sarai is okay, then she's okay. And she finished this segment by laying out Britt Baker with this DDT. And we are going to get this in a couple of weeks. And I tell you, if they have a banger of a match, we should all be very excited. This is definitely getting it up. Warm and fuzzy in my tum tum. This Orange Cassidy guy too. Love and love Because we were in the back with the factory and Jay Lethal's crew as they were all celebrating Cole Carter dressing up as Sting last week. And they even paid him off, which means, yes, for a day he was employed <laughs> as the fake Sting when Danhausen walked in and was like, I hate all of you. You ruined my Halloween celebrations. And I also think he said something like, you look stupid in hats. I love Dan Housen. Orange was here too and he was all like, oh man, can we stop arguing for goodness sake? I'm so bored of it. When QT Marshall said, all right, do you want to fight Lee Johnson on Rampage? Cassidy was like, yeah, cool, whatever. And he walked off. But then got this weird transition, although we were in the same environment, when the best friends were also talking to Lethal and Co. Trent was all like, Jay, I think you're an idiot. And Jay was like, well, I don't think I'm an idiot. Do you want to have a wrestling match later? Trent said, yes. So we got the wrestling match. Jay also jumped Trent during his entrance and I was dying here because Tony Schiavone and Taz are both like, yeah, more people should do that in AEW. So now they are actively saying people should be dicks. Because Trent wasn't ready, he did fall down and hurt his knee, which was going to tie into the entire match. And of course, eventually out came Satnap Singh, Jay Lethal, Dan Housen and Chuck Taylor. Because you ain't ever going to have a match like this without plenty of shenanigans. So we certainly did have some shenanigans. Otherwise though, it was mostly Lethal trying to rip the leg off Trent so he could have a third leg himself and call him three leg Lethal. And it got to the point where Trent had to stop a top rope elbow drop with his knee. And of course, this was really, really stupid. And this was also really, really smart. This is why I like AEW announcing too, because Taz even talked about that. Sometimes you've got to do what you have to do. Trent then started his comeback and hit this German suplex and this half and half suplex from the top rope, as well as a DDT. I tell you this, he's such a good baby face, he gets you rooting for him. He also hit a charging knee and I was like, Trent, what are you doing? That's your injured body part, pal. You're absolutely at risk here. Although he was able to set him up for the strong zero. But before he was able to hit it, da -da -da -da, here came the distraction. Because almost instantly, Sanjay Dutt was on the apron. So Dan Housen got in his face like, you're not doing this again. And when Satnam stood up, he tried to curse him. And when that magic didn't work, he just punched Sanjay right in the dick. That'll do it. There was more madness because then Singh took out Dan Housen and everybody was going crazy. And because of this, Jay Lethal was like, all right, he took over. He hit the lethal injection and he pinned Trent. And maybe afterwards we should all go talk to our buddies and say next time, stay in the back. I mean, this was a really good match, but it was absolutely bonkers. But I am going to give it an up because I had a good time. But once again, distraction counter comes down. Flip it up by one. And then... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my word. Because Tone was in the ring trying to have a word with Jay Lethal, Satnam Singh, and Sanjay Dutt. And they were like, would you go away right now? We don't want you. We want another WCW legend. <laughs> so out came Jeff Jarrett. Still not over it. Now, it does sound like he's got a major role backstage, which is going to be a huge help because he does have loads of experience. And here, he just went on one hell of a rant of a promo, putting Satnam Singh over as a monster, and also said something like, he ain't no clown made in a factory <laughs> wearing skinny red trousers. And if you're thinking that's a reference to Braun Strowman, well, it is. The whole point of this, though, was to also rag 
on Sting and Darby Allen, because at full gear, as far as I'm aware, and I did predict this in a video recently called Ten Insane Matches That Are Gonna Happen. You should check it out here on What Culture Wrestling. It is going to be Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal taking on Sting and Darby Allen. We also did this little bit of a skit where we acted like Jarrett had gone too long because the stage had was going, oh, please, Jeff, you need to shut up now. And he went absolutely crazy. And I actually think there's something in this. There is some nostalgia seeing Sting and Jarrett go at it once again, but I cannot get over this. And I know it's on me and I'm a nerd and I'm a geek, I'm an idiot and somebody should throw me down a well, but I can't get over this feeling that I'm seeing Jeff Jarrett on my Dynamite show but I'm not seeing Miro, and I haven't seen Miro now in about 10 years, and I think Miro is the greatest wrestler to ever walk this earth. That's why I come down on this side of the fence and I give it a down. Like, we're probably gonna get to full gear, and I'll love this match, because it'll be over the top and crazy, and Jeff Jarrett is still very good. But I'm drawing my line in the stand, going over here. Rene was then in the back with Jungle Boy, who was all like, I still hate Luchasaurus, I still hate Christian Cage, but I come up with a plan. And I'm going to tell you on Rampage. And I was like, damn it, Jungle Boy. That's like those Facebook posts where someone goes, it's such a bad day. Somebody else goes, oh, what's wrong, hun? And the original poster goes, can't tell you. If you can't tell anyone, why don't you shut up until you can? And then out came John Moxley. And he cut another great promo. Once again, Regal was at the center of this. So I has to be tying into the full gear match at some point. And Moxley was all like, look, when I was a young pup and I finally made it to the big time, I decided to go after William Regal to make a name for myself. And I soon learned this was a terrible idea, but holy crap did I also learn a lot about myself. And this was a reference to the FCW feud. So I thought that was pretty cool. He also said that all of this reminds him of one MJF, but then turned on a dime and was like, this Maxwell man, he acts like a tough guy wrestler, but his mum still buys his clothes. And he goes around saying, oh, I'm one of the four pillars of AEW, but that guy can't carry anything on his back. Mox also laughed about the fact that Friedman called himself the devil because John has looked the devil in the eyes and it ate MGF. I'm like, yeah, I knew that already. We all know the devil is Dave Grohl. He finished this by saying that everything that Maxwell Jacob Friedman has done to this point is easy. So it's time to find out what he's really made at when it comes to the pay-per-view. And this was just every single word that needed to be said, said in a way that made you go flub me sideways. I need to go and watch this match. I still think MGF has to win, but how we get there, I do not know. But we are gonna find out, people, because we are on the road to destiny. I don't even know what that means. Uh, we then continue to tease the return of the elite because we got another one of these videos with people disappearing. Although this time we had photos of them with Adam Cole, with Sami Zayn, with Kevin Owens, with Finn Balor. So everyone's gonna go crazy about that. But the main takeaway is that we also saw a full gear sign and the picture of a giant clock. So surely they are coming back for the pay-per-view. They will go after Death Triangle, who will fall out because Pac is obsessed with his hammers. They will win their trio's titles back. And we can just move forward and pretend that none of this happened. I think that's probably for the best. And someone needs to go and check on Sky Blue, because <laughs> my word. She was facing Jamie Hayter, who is the number one contender for the AEW Women's Championship. And while she actually looked pretty good here and got in some decent moves, ultimately, Jamie just absolutely whipped her ass. I mean, some of the maneuvers she got caught in, hurt me. She could also be really annoyed though, because when she was rocking and rolling, of course, Britt Baker grabbed her foot and cast that interference. And this is when Hater opened up with all those suplexes. And never forget that Jamie Hater is a very good wrestler. Given that her friends were being dicks though, eventually Sky did kick out of Britt Baker and Sky Blue. Like, would you get out of here? And then she hit this code red. And I would say it was for a near fall. And like, the ref did go, Oh, and we kicked out at the last second. But also, did I truly believe that Blue was going to win? No, I did not. They then traded kicks, which you rarely see. But honestly, Hater's one was like it came from the depths of hell. She really smacked her. Although Sky was still able to bust out the most devastating move in all oh, a sports entertainment surprise roll up. But that didn't work. So Jamie Hater wound up that big lariat absolutely killed her and she got the win. Every time she hits that, I think I lose five years of my life and I'm not even involved. And of course, afterwards, she started putting the boots to Sky Blue. So Tony Storm chased her off. I've said this once, I've said it twice. I'll say it for a third time. Jamie Hayter should win this championship at the pay-per-view or Britt Baker should cost her. And then we can go and do that feud instead. Thought this was more than solid though. 
up. We then picked up the fact that the World Title Tournament continues on Rampage when it is Brian Cage versus Dante Martin. And that's going to be a banger. When Alex Marvez wanted to get involved in this, because he was like, oh, hey, why don't we chat to Ricky Starks, who's also in this tournament? I think he must have eye problems, though. Because he was saying this to us, like I'm saying it to you now. And quite literally here, just off camera, Lance Archer had Ricky Starks in a chokehold. How did Alex Marvez not see this? He was also trying to rip Stark's head off and he just threw him into the steel grate. As Alex Marvez was like, oh no, somebody help him. I was like, you, you're supposed to help him, Alex Marvez. This is like me being here and an old woman being in front of me and getting robbed. And the police arrive and said, I didn't even see it. Lance also told us that everybody is gonna die and the cops didn't seem to care, although they probably should when somebody walks around saying such things. But I do have to tell you this. I love backstage segments like it because you only get them in wrestling. Which did indeed bring us to our main event, Sammy Guevara versus Brian Danielson in a two out of three falls match. What always makes me chuckle is that when Sammy is in a main event, people are like, oh man, I don't want to see him on my screens. And then he just absolutely tears it up. That guy is really good. You should go out of your way to watch it too, especially because it spruced up the Ring of Honor World title four-way. We are getting it full gear. But also we did that wonderful thing in a two out of three falls match where the bad guy has a plan. So when they were fighting on the outside of the ring and Danielson was going to do a dive, Ty Mella said, stop, do not hit my husband. And of course, Brian is a good guy, so he did it. And when he turned around, Sam had a chair and he just threw it right into his face. This was all part of the plan though, because he then got a microphone and kind of stuffed it down Brian Danielson. Danielson's throat because he had decided all right well I'm gonna go one down because I will get disqualified which I did but then Brian Danielson will be nothing but mush and I'll be able to get two easy falls and the commentators kept saying this over and over again it's a story that always works there was certainly something to this too because not only was Brian bleeding but then Sammy was like yeah all right he picked him up, he hit the GTH, and he pinned Danielson for the one, two, three. So now it is one to one. Brian was in a weekend position. I just started to clap. Of course, this is Sammy Guevara, so rather than just hit his finishing move again, he was like, nah, man, I'm gonna do a top rope Spanish fly, which is when Brian pushed him over and he decided to go for the flying headbutt. And did he hit this? No, he did not. <laughs> and his head went straight into the mat. So I was terrified about Daniel's brain throughout this whole thing. And at one point, Guevara even locked in the label lock because he is an idiot. But the way Brian fought back by this was just doing headbutt after headbutt after headbutt again. And I was like, why is nobody thinking about my stomach? It also led to this awesome springboard knee by Brian Danielson as they just started to fight everywhere. And yes, at one point he was going to win the thing when Ty Mello pulled out the referee. And you're probably saying to yourself, well, shouldn't that be a disqualification? And the answer is yes, but in wrestling, nobody seems to care. Thankfully, the official was like, yeah, Ty, you've got to go now because you've been too much of an absolute idiot. So she did leave. <laughs> this is when Daniels and Guevara just punched each other in the face over and over again. I suppose they just wanted to get some blood. We also saw the most insane shooting star press to the outside, which Guevara did. And once again, he's just so damn good. But basically, when they got back in the ring, he went for a swan time. Daniel Bryan, excuse me, Bryan Danielson got his knees up. He then transitioned into the label lock after smashing his skull in with the elbows. And while Sam refused to tap at first, I tell you, Danielson twerked this, twerked this, twerked this so much. Anybody would have had to have said, I quit. Sammy Guevara did. Brian Danielson won. This was so much fun and both guys look so good. I'm going to say that nobody was the loser here. And once again, you should go out of your way to see this. I'm now massively intrigued about this Ring of Honor match at the pay-per-view too, which means it did its job. It is getting a powerful up. This did bring us to the end of another episode of AEW Dynamite. And I really think we found our momentum at the moment because AEW always seems to come alive when they are going into a pay-per-view. Right now, I am pretty amped for full gear. So I shall take my finger of power. Shall give it up. Now, please do leave a comment below and let me know what you thought about last night's episode of AEW Dynamite. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com where we'll keep you up to date with all the AEW news. Come follow us on social media at Simon316 and WhatCultureWWE. And we have lots of ups and downs videos, and they want to be watched. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me as always. I'm going to take this silly costume off now. I mean, sometimes you've just got to do what you have to do. Goodbye.